about two or three times a year, a company offers me a dial laser engraver to review. And two or three times a year, I check the specs, thank them for their time, and politely decline. Most are simply so bad, I don't want my using them to be seen as any kind of endorsement. Today, I'm looking at the Mr. Carf M3, the first style laser that maybe, just maybe, is a viable competitor to a small CO2 laser. Let me tell you my thoughts while I unboxed it and set it up. So laser engravers basically take whatever kind of 2D CAD drawing or raster artwork you have and cut or engrave that in wood, leather, acrylic, or a few other materials. They are one of the three main digital fabrication tools used in maker spaces along with 3D printers and CNC routers. Think about it like an automated jigsaw that lets you cut perfect lines and curves extremely quickly. Lots of people use them to personalize objects and engrave things but my interest is almost exclusively in cutting. I want to make prototypes and I don't want to have to wait a few hours or even days for them to 3D print. Dow lasers have been around for a long time, but at the low end, they never really have the power to compete with CO2 lasers as a fabrication tool. This hasn't stopped companies from trying though and selling all sorts of dodgy and frankly dangerous laser dial engraving setups. Lots of reviewers like myself have sworn off them, but never say never. I've seen some signs of progress that makes me inclined to give this one a try. Particularly because right now I have a specific need for something a lot smaller and a lot cheaper than my large CO2 laser cutter you've seen me use in the past. The Mr. Carve M3 has two different laser heads, blue and infrared, which you use depends on what you are cutting or engraving. The infrared is used for engraving metals. It can cut material up to 8mm thick which is more than enough for my needs today. And they claim it has a work area of just under 400 by 400 millimeters, which is a lot larger than CO2 lasers in this price range. As it turns out, this is not true. The effective work area is actually 320 by 320. They say the version that ships to Kickstarter backers will be larger, but I can only reveal what they have now, not what they promise. And what they have now is 320 by 320, which is still very large for a laser engraver in this price range. It has a mobile app for simple stuff, but I prefer to use my laptop. As most of you remember from my previous video, I'm working with something called upper room germicidal irradiation. UR UVGI is a very mature, very safe technology that has been used to fight tuberculosis for decades. What I developed is a low cost, easy to fabricate open source UR UVGI fixture that allows for this technology to be implemented cheaply any place in the world. And independently of increasingly fragile supply lines, I've been able to spend time on this project thanks to a small grant from Victory Buterin's Bowie Foundation. So I named the fixtures Buterin Wool Fixtures as a little thank you because it's pretty cool that he and others in the community are putting money into this sort of moonshot projects. Because I feel the global supply chain really cannot be trusted at this point. I'm designing these fixtures to be made with local laser cutters using easily available local materials like thin plywood. They aren't pretty, but they can be made almost anywhere in the world in small local shops with off-the-shelf parts. While laser cutters are quite common, they are still a $3,000 to $5,000 too not everyone have access to. So what I want to see today is can I make the new wall-mounted Wuthering wool fixture I just designed on the Mr. Carve M3, a tool that only costs a few hundred instead of a few thousand dollars? Because 
that would make this even more accessible. Okay, I've already set it up. Let's give it a go. I'm putting some aluminum tape on the inside to reflect more of the light forward and up. And this is a pretty short fixture, but you can just stretch the design to accommodate longer, more powerful mercury vapor lamps. Now, the whole point of upper room UEGI is to keep all the dangerous UV light in the upper part of the room far above people's heads, skin, and well out of eyesight. That's what these louvers are for mounted at the correct height of a bit over two meters. It's impossible to see or be exposed to the UV light. It just shines upwards and by painting the fixture black, we can make sure there's no straight reflection of the light color wood. Now there's another kind of ultraviolet that you may have seen in the news far UVC, which is in the 222 nanometer range and it is eye and skin safe. At the moment though, it is far far more expensive than 254 nanometer light, so not yet affordable for the rest of the world. It also has not been tested as thoroughly or for as long as upper room UVGI. That said, it is very promising technology and I will be testing far UVC products in upcoming videos. Now this only solves half the problem. Working on UVGI is a bit like working on AC mains wiring. You can't just put it in. You also need tools to test it to make sure you put it in correctly and it won't hurt anyone. You absolutely cannot just make one of these in your garage and mount it and hope for the best. Excessive amounts of UV could bounce off the ceiling, shiny decorations, and create UV hotspots in the room areas with excessively high UV readings. So the second part of promoting upper room UVGI is sending our kids to researchers and environmental engineers so they can learn how to implement these solutions safely in their cities and countries. It's sort of like a software development kit. It has all the meters and tools they need to learn about this tech and work with local decision makers to figure out the best way to implement this type of solution. Let me show you how I've been making those kits. Okay, I'm gonna use this pretty cool app called Two Kaiser to make two cutouts in foam for all of the meters I'm sending out. What you do is you take a picture of it on a standard piece of paper. You take a few pictures of each of the tools that you want to make phone cutouts of and it automatically outlines it. And it gives you the SVG files so that you can load it into your laser cutter. But it also lets you edit it. They do have an online app, you get a little URL, you go to the online app and they've got all sorts of tools. You can set up your custom toolbox, you can align everything, do all of those vector art functions you need to do in order to set up a toolbox. Obviously, I don't need all the same meter, I'm just gonna explore one of these as an SVG. The shape looks good 
and I'm going to go back and do other meters. You can save it as a JSON file, which has all of that data, or as an SVG file, which is what I'm going to do before import it into Lightburn. I have all my tool cutouts, and I'm going to click frame to show the cutting area of the laser, so I can make sure all fits on the 20mm EVA foam piece I have here. And then I need to change the number of passes. It takes 5 passes to get for 20mm EVA foam, but it should be pretty clean. And the wires and accessories goes here. Okay, pros and cons. Cons. I'm used to CO2 laser cutters. I use mine several times a week. This has a different software tooling. In the end, it did exactly what I needed it to, but it took me about a day to figure out how to get it to do that. Most people get down lasers to engrave stuff. If you have an Etsy store or sell any kinds of crafts, you probably already have one of these. If not, it will pay for itself fairly quickly. Personally, I have no interest in engraving. I want to cut, and that's a lot harder. The M3 did a job, and now I know how to do it. But you are going to need to learn that yourself. It's not like a table saw or a router. There are a lot of variables to play with, and they change with each different material. It will cut what they say though, and in decent time, and with an edge that needs only a little cleanup. The advertised cutting areas is incorrect, at least as far as what they have now. 320 by 320 is still very generous. I don't think it is a major limitation, but I'd prefer if I was reviewing exactly what was shipping. Last, ventilation and exhaust remains the weak point of all fabrication lasers. Big ones usually have a giant hose and noisy vent exhaust to carry the smoke and fumes to the outside. The Mr. Carve comes with this filter box. The filter box works well, but it's hard to position to suck up all the fumes. I also have two large doors that I left open. I'm working in a big open space and have very good cross ventilation. This would be perfect for a garage where you could lift up the door while you work or even a balcony. I would not use it in a small room with the window closed though. You need to set up something to vent that small outside. You just don't want to be breathing that. It also has no cover, so this is strictly a 16 years old and up tool. Pros. It's a bit less powerful, but a lot cheaper and more compact than a CO2 laser cutter with the same size cutting area. It's also lined up to put away in a closet or up on the shelf. Not an option with a CO2 laser cutter. It doesn't need a water supply to cool the tube. It's also a lot quieter than a CO2 laser. You can also place it on a board larger than itself and engrave that. The work does not have to fit inside the machine. Final verdict. Is the Mr. Cuff a replacement for a full-size CO2 laser cutter like I've shown in the past? No, not at all. Is it a replacement for a CO2 laser cutter that's comparable in cost? Yes, absolutely. But with the caveat, you still need the same exhaust procedures with the M3 you employ with any laser cutter. So plan that out. Most importantly, the M3 does specifically what I and maybe some of you need. 
which is to cut a variety of flat materials sufficiently cleanly to make objects quickly. If you compare it to a cheap CO2 eBay laser, not a large 80 watt one light I've shown you earlier, you'll have realistic expectations. That said, it is a Kickstarter and you all know what that means, but they have delivered on earlier campaigns and I would not have agreed to do a review if I have any doubts about their ability to deliver on this one. That's it for today. Big thanks to Vitalik Buterin's Bowie Foundation for their support. Hopefully we can save some lives with this tech without interfering too much with people actually living those lives and going about their business somewhat normally. I know mitigation tech can be a little stressful, but it is an important branch of tech these days, so I do want to cover it a bit. We've all got to know about this stuff so we can make smarter choices. If there is anything else you'd like to see more of, please let me know in the comments. That's it for today. Until next time, if I can do it, anyone can do it.